So we are here today with Professor Jason Brennan. Um, I like to um, assign people in my classes to read on education. It's a book by Harry Brighouse, and their Brighouse is concerned with such things as what do we want education to do for students? What kinds of things do we want students to have through schooling by the time they, they get of age as an adult? And particularly, uh, this session is gonna be focused on chapter four, creating citizens. So those of you who are watching can, can follow along. So let me introduce uh, Professor Brennan and then we can kind of get down to details because I think Professor Brennan um, and myself actually disagree with some of Brickhouse's conclusions. So we're gonna flesh out where the agreements lie, disagreements lie, et cetera. So uh, Dr. Jason Brennan is a professor of strategy, economics, ethics, and public policy at the McDonough School of Business and by courtesy, associate professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. Formerly, he was assistant professor in philosophy research at Brown University. He specializes in political philosophy and applied ethics I personally read several of uh, Dr. Brennan's books, including um, uh, The Ethics of Voting, Why Not Capitalism, and a new book he's uh, just publishing with Professor Peter Jaworski called Markets Without Limits. And I've enjoyed them all. So Professor Brennan, it's great to have you with us Thanks. today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Sure, sure. So I, um, as a way of background, I was reading this book to figure out whether I wanted to teach it to my students who do philosophy of education and, and related things. And chapter four is about creating citizens, right? So he, uh, Harry Brighouse lays out three things that he thinks schools will, should potentially do to create good citizens. And from uh, discussions I've had with you and from things I've read online, I think it's fair to say that you disagree in certain areas with Dr. Brighouse. So I thought it'd be really interesting to kind of walk through uh, Harry Brighouse's arguments and talk about where the agreements and disagreements lie. So I guess the first question is, when I gave you this uh, chapter to read, um, your overall impressions of the chapter, your overall impressions with Dr. Brickhouse's arguments, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting chapter because it's very conventional. Uh, he's presenting a very conventional view of what education is supposed to do, a kind of conventional view about whether it's actually able to do it. And, you know, Brickhouse is a very good philosopher, and it might just be that the audience this is aimed at, but uh, this is kind of, it's under-argued in a sense. Um, if you were skeptical of his conclusions, he doesn't give you a lot of reasons to come to his side. So if you're already on his side, then the types of things that he's saying are going to sound plausible, but if you disagree with anything, he's not really trying to get you to move over to his position. Right. Yeah, I, I agree that there is, um, although I would also uh, figure that he probably assumes that most people will probably agree with all three of these. They're fairly conventional. Maybe the third one is a bit odd. Maybe most people don't think of, of about the third of his criteria, but the first two are pretty conventional. So maybe he might even figure that it's really on, the onus theoretically should be on the person who disagrees to argue. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Let's go with the first one, because the first one is probably the hardest to disagree with. Like I said, I mean, it's a pretty conventional viewpoint. Uh, so his idea is that schools, in order to teach good citizenship, should really be thinking about um, creating in citizens a, dis a disposition to follow the law. So the quote he has here is, the good citizen in a society that has democratic institutions, the effective rule of law, and reasonable protection of individual freedom, should be disposed to obey laws that are passed by the government, even when she disagrees with those laws, and even when she believes the laws are unjust. So he goes on to say that, of course, a lot of us break laws that are kind of trivial. Uh, we you know, uh, go over the speed limit, doesn't really harm a lot of people. Uh, we might even be justified in stealing a car if it's necessary to drive someone who's go certainly gonna die to the hospital. But he says, overall, schools should teach the disposition to obey the law, and that it's good to obey the law, even when you think that law is unjust. Yeah. So what do we think of, of, that, uh, of that argument? One thing to note is that he's, he's starting with the assumption that we're talking about school systems in relatively just societies, and he's pushing off to the side relatively unjust societies. And, you know, if you're in a relatively just society, then it sort of follows statistically that uh, the laws are likely to be good laws, and they're likely to be laws you have reasons to obey independently of the fact that they're laws. So a lot of laws are like that. Like, I shouldn't murder you and you shouldn't murder me, not because it's the law, but because it's the wrong thing to do independently of whether it's the law. Um, the problem, I think, is like, how do you, what, one issue with that is how do you really know that you are in that kind of society? Um, so would the U.S. qualify? I mean, we have lots of horrific things that happen in the U.S. We have police that brutalize citizens for no, no good reason. Um, should we obey laws requiring us to defer to police? Or should we be, or are we outside of that category where we actually shouldn't have this general disposition to obey the law because our society is not particularly just? And it's not just a problem for citizens to figure out, it's also a problem for 
administrators and the teachers themselves because they're of course going to they're part of the government they're of course going to push the view that they should be deferred to and government should be deferred to and we might be worried about governments taking it upon themselves to teach citizens to defer to the governments because the government even the bad governments are going to be saying the exact same thing that said i think there's a deeper issue here which is that uh Brigelles is talking about a topic in philosophy called authority. Authority is the view, or a government has authority when it has the power to create in you, one of its subjects or citizens, a duty to obey its commands. Um, so you have an obligation to do something because the government says so. So importantly, for authority to exist, it has to be because the government says so. So I have an obligation not to murder you, and it's also against the law, but my obligation not to murder you exists independently of it being the law. If I, as we're sitting here, if I get a letter from... Obama giving me a license to kill, I'm still not supposed to kill you, even though I've been giving permission by the government. Mm -hmm. So the idea of authority is you have a duty to obey the law because it's the law, because the government told you to do so. And the worry about this, and I think it's kind of surprising that Brighouse is taking this position, is that philosophers tend to be really skeptical whether there is such a thing as authority, whether there is such a thing as a duty to obey the law per se. And the reason for that is that they've spent 2,500 years trying to come up with theories to explain why there would be a duty to obey the law. And it's pretty clear that all the major theories fail, like the theories based on consent and social contract and so on. None of these theories really get off the ground. They're all really problematic. And so skepticism about government authority is sort of the default position among political philosophers now. Now that said, I guess, I guess he could be saying something like, well, even if we philosophers kind of know that there probably isn't really a duty to obey the law, it might be useful for the government to push that view anyways. Uh, because it's kind of dangerous to tell people that there maybe isn't such a thing as a duty to obey the law. And I think the issue here is, it's not that you should feel free to disobey the law whenever you think it's unjust. That's that's obviously an absurd view. Like, suppose I'm a, I just happen to have the view that oh, I think laws requiring me not to kill people are unjust, so therefore I'm going to feel free to go around killing people. But that doesn't make sense. It's not the right view. The view is rather, you should feel, like what, what the lack of authority means is that you may disobey the law whenever the law is actually requiring you to do something unjust or, or requiring you to do something you shouldn't do. So what's in fact unjust rather than what you think is unjust. That's mm -hmm. the issue. Right. We don't, it's the same thing with soldiers. We might say like, well, you as a soldier should disobey orders you believe to be unjust because you could be wrong. Rather, it's you may disobey orders that are in fact unjust. Right. Yeah, there's certain things that kind of um, trouble me about even uh, – you know, this, this first criteria that Breakhouse has that they're similar to what you brought up. Uh, the, the first one is that, uh, is there a potential conflict of interest at some point with uh, a state run education system, assuming that the students are in public schools, uh, being an organism that says you, you need to obey the laws that this other organ of the state, the legislature, whomever creates, uh, it seems like there could be some sort of potential for conflict of interest. Um, but the other is he, he doesn't really um, give a criterion for when you should be following a law and when you shouldn't be following a law. And that, that concerns me for two reasons. First is we can think of obvious cases where social justice has progressed because people did not follow the law. In several chapters, he brings up Rosa Parks and the ACLU's case uh, where, you know, challenging the idea that the law was that black people or non-white people should sit at the back of the bus. And uh, that law was one partially because there were legal channels that went through the court system, but also partially because there was people who were actually willing to break the law um, and then use extra legal means to do it. Um, so my concern is that if you're teaching students to, uh, that you should have a disposition to obey the law, you may want to back that with some very firm rationale for, okay, but uh, how do you know when you should be obeying the law? Are there laws that are just so unjust that you shouldn't obey them, like you know, non-whites sitting at the back of the bus or, or whatever, and how would you know that? Because it's gonna get confusing to students when you go into things like the civil rights movement, the women's uh, liberation movement, things like that, where people did break the law. And even in textbooks, we celebrate that. The, the example that I like to think about is, uh, as of this recording, I think the U.S. government and the Mint is debating putting, putting Harriet Tubman on uh, the $20 bill, I believe it is. And of course, Harriet Tubman, um, her claim to fame, so to speak, and rightly so, was that she broke slave laws by helping slaves escape their masters. So if you teach students that you should obey the law, you're going to have a hard time teaching students that Harriet Tubman did a good thing and having them be able to reconcile that. Yeah. 
Um, and the other thing I guess it brings up for me was um, when should government be relatively neutral about what laws you should obey and not. Uh, I, I think particularly of a case uh, recent, I guess fairly recently, a year and something ago as of this recording, where a young uh, teenage man named Michael Brown in um, St. Louis, Missouri, or uh, I'm sorry, in Ferguson, Missouri, was shot and killed by a police officer. We don't know the circumstances around that. But one of the controversies that actually occurred in New York City um, was that um, quite a few teachers started bringing in t-shirts, uh, their middle school teachers, that said, you know, support NYPD. And the problem I saw with that was that a lot of their students were young black kids who lived in inner cities where police violence is most likely to take place. Mm -hmm. So now if you're being taught by a teacher who's telling you to obey the police who aren't necessarily nice to members of your community, uh, that could be problematic in and of itself. So maybe there are cases where uh, the schools should actually be fairly neutral on whether or not you should obey the law, especially in the case of a controversial law. Yeah. I guess, I guess you know, Brighouse's best response to all these comments is just to say, well, again, I'm simply talking about what they should teach in just societies. And maybe in light, all our comments show is that the U.S. isn't sufficiently just for these comments to actually apply to U.S. education. Um, which, if so, fine. But uh, that, I, I think he does intend for this to apply to U.S. education. Yeah, yeah. And I guess if that's the response, it would probably be good for him to differentiate between when we know that a society meets the criteria for him to say, yes, it applies here and it doesn't apply here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, so the next criteria or the next thing he thinks that schools should at least ideally do to create uh, good citizens is uh, he believes that students should be taught to um, further goals of social justice through the political arena. So he says, for instance, the second related element is a disposition to engage in political participation through legal channels to achieve justice. Yeah. And uh, one of the reasons that this was about the point where I thought, wow, it'd be good to hear Dr. Brennan's response to this, because I know you've done some papers and some work on uh, pursuing civic virtue and, uh, and, and social justice through non-political arenas and how it's even sometimes more common that you can achieve social justice through non-political arenas. Right. So maybe uh, you can talk about your thoughts about, about this uh, criterion of, of Dr. Berghaus's. Yeah, I worry that he has an overly narrow view of what citizenship is and what civic virtue is. And uh, my analogy for this is with courage and how the ancient and archaic Greeks thought of courage. So the archaic Greeks are the Greeks of Homer's time, the time that Homer is writing about. And the archaic Greeks had a very narrow view of what courage is. Courage is a martial virtue, a military violent virtue, exercised only by men and really only on the battlefield. Now, we share a concept of courage with them, but we recognize their idea of courage is too narrow. Courage isn't just about fighting. Courage is about having the disposition to deal appropriately with risk, right? And courage can be exhibited by pretty much anyone, anywhere. You can be courageous while giving birth, which is a thought that would have scandalized the Greeks of Homer's time. A woman being courageous, not fighting. Uh, we recognize that we have a better understanding of what courage is. Their understanding of courage is over narrow. Similarly, I think what a lot of people think about civic virtue, they've got a kind of old-fashioned view of civic virtue, which goes back to classical Rome, where civic virtue is a political is about political participation. It's something done mostly by men, you know, a certain kind of educated men in the Roman Republic, and they've just taken that model of what civic virtue is and they just plop it onto modern-day society, um, and then just say, well, what everyone can do it. And I think they're maybe overly narrow. And the reason for this is when you try to, if you look through the history of how people define the word civic virtue, the concept of civic virtue, you find almost unanimous definitions. Everyone from 2,500 years ago to now says to be civically virtuous is to be disposed to um, try to further the common good of your society. That's the basic definition. You're disposed to have some ability to further the common good of your society. Notice that there's nothing in that that makes it just a matter of logic that it's about political participation. It leaves open that there are all sorts of ways one can contribute to the common good aside from political participation. And uh, it's not clear that political participation is necessary or that's sufficient or that it's a particularly valuable way of, of furthering the common good. So I like, I like to think like, you know, take a comic book and um, uh, Batman saves Gotham City but never votes. It'd be really weird to say, well, you know, Bruce Wayne never votes again. It would really be weird to say that like, Bruce Wayne doesn't have civic virtue. You'd say, no, he's done his part. He's exercised civic virtue through another means. What about, say, 
a scientific genius named Phyllis the Physician who comes up constantly with new medical interventions that save lives, but she never votes. It really, we're, I think, offensive, like, really offensive, actually, to say that she lacks civic virtue because she doesn't participate in government. I think, well, no, she does other things. And those are kind of extreme cases, but I think what's true there generalizes. Like, for any one of us, the best way to ex exhibit civic virtue will depend upon our particular skills, our particular opportunities, and also, like, what other people are doing. For some of us, it might mean specializing in politics. For others, it might mean specializing uh, in non-political activities to the exclusion of political activities. And for others, it might mean a mix. And the one, one other kind of fun worry about this is that it's not clear that political participation is actually all that effective. I mean, there have been all these studies looking at millennials, and current generation, and how they're relatively non-political compared to older generations. Uh, you know, my the baby boomers, like when they wanted to get something done, they'd form a committee. And the current generation, when they want to get something, and then like form a committee and like push the government to do something. And that sort of brings out this generation. And the current generation, when they see something's problematic, their solution is not to form a uh, you know committee and start petitioning the government, but to actually tackle it head on. They tend to go for extra non-political routes. Well, what's better? Well, you know, politics isn't all that effective. Uh, it's, it's worth noting here, and this is depressing, that your vote counts for basically nothing. The chances that your vote will make any difference are vanishingly small. Um, so even if there's a lot at stake in a particular election, um, it doesn't mean that it means it's worth a lot for you to vote for it. In the same way that like winning the lottery is wonderful, but doesn't mean it's rational to buy a ticket. So in some sense, uh, if he's asking for political participation, he's actually setting the bar really low because donating money is kind of easy. Advocating stuff is relatively easy. Voting is relatively easy. None of these things really have much of an effect on an individual level. And you might be able to do a lot more good outside of politics. Yeah. So, um, I wonder if Dr. Brighouse would would disagree with that. I mean, that uh, I think it's what you're saying is it's it's not that you disagree that the political means are are you know we should teach children, students that that these are means available to them to help further social justice. You're saying that really the conception needs to be wider. Yeah. That really, what you need to do you should have a public spiritedness in mind. Whether you're starting a business that um, you know provides goods and services that people want, or whether you're volunteering somewhere in a non-political way, or whether you're voting and, and doing something like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the same way, like, uh, when I said, like, the archaic Greeks have an overly narrow conception of uh, courage, it's not that I would say to them, you're wrong, you can't exercise courage on the battlefield. You say, no, you're right that you can exercise courage there, it's just you can also exercise courage in all these other arenas that you are overlooking. I think Brighouse and most people have sort of the same problem when it comes to civic virtue. They've got an overly narrow conception of civic virtue where it's a particular kind of activity done in a particular arena when in fact it can be exercised almost anywhere. Sure. I know one concern I had with the chapter, um, with this part, was that he differentiates between um, using the political arena to pursue social justice, to think of, to, to be altruistic in kind of your your um, attempts, versus using the public arena to be kind of self-interested. And yeah. the example he uses is the parent who pursues special education advocacy because her child is special is in special education and she wants her child and other child children to be served, and then he contrasts that with the farmer who seeks farm subsidies for himself and and his family because he wants himself and his family to be taken care of, uh, and I think Brighouse makes this distinction as if it were obvious because we're going to look at the example and say well of course the mother is public spirited and the farmer is private has a private interest in mind. But the way he phrases the example, actually they're both self-interested and altruistic. Uh, it's very doubtful that the woman would advocate for special education services if she didn't have a friend or relative or someone very close to her who needed those services. But at the same time, she's publicly spirited. Whereas if you look at the farm example, I mean, you could imagine a farmer just pursuing their self-interest by pursuing farm subsidies. But often uh, people, you know, kind of convince themselves that, no, farm subsidies are in the interest of everyone. I just happen to benefit from them. So right. I don't really see the two cases as as, uh, as distinct, maybe, as Dr. Brighouse originally paints them. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, if you were saying something like, look, there are procedure-independent standards of justice. Whatever those happen to be, you should only pursue those through your voting or your lobbying or something. That's that's a plausible view. I actually think that's I, that's my view. I think that's mm -hmm. true. You shouldn't, you shouldn't really pursue your your private interest per se. You should pursue the common good, whatever that happens to be. Um, 
So yeah, I agree with that in the abstract. The question is what actually differentiates one case from the other? Why, why do you have any reason to think that like, one is common in the common good and the other isn't? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you're right, like, um, we know like, economists hate farm subsidies. That's a common example. Like, they think they're socially destructive. They think they're harmful to almost everyone in society. They're harmful to people in other nations as well. Economists will say farm subsidies are one of the reasons, like, farm subsidies in Europe and in the United States and Canada are one of the reasons why there's so much starvation in the third world. That's a very common view. Nevertheless, we also know through polling that almost everyone in the first world who isn't a farmer believes that farm subsidies are good for society because they don't understand economics, they don't understand the reasoning behind it, they think this is a good thing to do. They think they're like making sure their society is secure and they have sufficient food and all these other things. So sure, the farmer in this example is doing something that benefits him, but if he's a typical American, he also believes that this is good for everyone. It's not just a self-centered delusion, but it's just what people think because they don't understand economics. Right. Um, so we need to have like some sort of independent theory of what justice is and then say, well, you're only allowed to push to get Whatever, like rank all possible states of affairs according to procedure, independent standards of justice, and then the only things you're allowed to lobby for or push for or vote for are things that move you higher up in that hierarchy. Sure. Um, I think that's true. He doesn't really give us any any reason to believe that one is in one camp and one is in the other. I guess his his assumption must be something like, well, one thing society is supposed to do is to look out for the least advantaged and. Archer Daniels Midland, the uh, farming company that he's talking about, they're a powerful corporation. Uh, they're al already advantaged, and special needs children are disadvantaged. And that's probably true, but it, even if that's the case, it could still be that special needs kids are already getting more than their fair share of educational materials. Uh, so it's not obvious they should be getting more. I, I do think it's obvious Archer Daniels Mid Midland should be getting less. That's pretty clear from the economics. Right. right. Yeah, so let's move on to the, the third of Breakhouse's um, things that he thinks uh, schools should do to pursue uh, good citizenship. And this is probably one that wouldn't really occur to many people, although there's a live debate in philosophy about it. So uh, this third one, I'll, I'll read the quote and then we'll do our best to summarize what he means. So he says, when we engage in politics using public reasoning, we should not make claims and arguments that cannot be accepted by others unless they, the others, already hold fundamental moral commitments about which we expect reasonable people to disagree. Yeah. So I think what he's saying here is that if you and I are engaged in a public debate or we're engaged with a lot of other people in a kind of public debate about public policy, and I want to convince you that the government should support the poor with welfare, an argument that I shouldn't use would be something like, um, I want the poor to be supported with welfare because God says that we should take care of the poor. And the reason it seems like is because if other people in the room are non-religious or maybe um, of, an, of a different religion, it's going to be really hard for them to accept that argument. They might accept the conclusion, but not the argument. Right. So a better, uh, a, a more breakhouse friendly response would be, I believe that uh, governments should use welfare to help the poor because everyone deserves a minimal standard of well-being. Because yeah. It doesn't matter whose religion is what in that room. Everyone can talk about that idea, and everyone's kind of included in that debate. It's a nice way to argue. Uh, sometimes philosophers call this the duty of civility within arguments. Like you only rely upon reasons and evidence that are publicly available. So if God's whispering in my ear right now and telling me the truth, if I, like you have no reason to think God's whispering in my ear. So if I use those sorts of arguments, well, I happen to know that it's going to be 75 degrees tomorrow because God told me well, you, you have no reason to believe me, so I shouldn't use that argument. There's a kind of uh, theoretical basis for this, this sorts of, like, why believe that? There's a theoretical basis for this kind of view of public discourse. It's grounded in a view called public reason liberalism. And the basic idea behind public reason liberalism is that coercive policies, in order to be justified, ha have to be justified to each individual person subject to those policies according to reasons that that person can find compelling, supposing that person's reasonable. The problem with Brighouse here is that he's getting he's he's getting it wrong. What public reason liberalism actually says, public reason liberalism puts a very high bar on justifying coercion. It says, in order to justify coercion, I have to be able to show you, given your pro like your reasons, that this these norms I want to coerce you to follow are justified according to you, right? So it does require that if I'm going to advocate in public, say a rule like uh, you have to you're not allowed to smoke marijuana and I have to be able to appeal to everybody given their reasons it doesn't require that you have public reasons to object to things so 
that's the problem with public reason liberalism. Might one of why the theory might not be able to work is that uh, in order to justify coercion, you have to have these undefeated public reasons on behalf of it. To show coercion is not justified if you, a private citizen, happen to have a private reason to reject the policy that I can't defeat the person advocating on behalf of coercion. Then, the, by by definition, then the uh, policy isn't justified. So, really, what if you if you make it more accurate to what public reason liberalism actually says, what he would say is, when you're justifying coercing people into doing things, you must rely upon publicly available evidence and widespread reasons that everybody can accept. When you're rejecting coercive policies, you don't have to do that. It's interesting that he does this because what almost every public reason liberalist does is almost reverse the the, the the under the argument, it's like the purpose of public reason liberalism is to is to respect our fellow citizens by making it difficult to coerce them. What happens is though you get kind of like left leaning professors who read the theory and then they go, ah, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use this theory to explain why religious conservatives can't object to the policies I want to impose upon them. Right. But in fact, what the theory is supposed to do is make it hard for you, the secular person, to impose things upon the religious conservative. Right. Right, sure. Brighouse does it, and almost everyone else does, but it's just a misunderstanding. So basically what he should be saying is that, um, let's say we're talking about the abortion debate, which is obviously fraught with religious implications. Yeah. So if we have people of diverse religions, and I want to justify that either abortion is wrong or abortion should be morally permitted, it's really my duty to make sure that I offer up reasons that everyone in the room can accept, especially, which is going to be especially difficult because everyone in the room may be completely different religiously, may have different worldviews. So it should make it harder on me to justify coercing other people because I have to kind of find a way to uh, find arguments that everyone in the room could really potentially. Yes. Yeah, that's cool. But if you're, if you're objecting to coercion, you don't have to have a public reason. Like, that's the, that's the funny thing about public reason liberalism is that you, let's say you have a policy that you want to implement on me, and, I, and I, it happens to be the case God is, in fact, whispering in my ear, telling me that law is unjust and isn't giving me any evidence I can share with you that God's whispering in my ear. Well, it's an implication of public reason liberalism that, in fact, the law is unjustified, even though I can't show you that. So yeah, it's, it's interesting because in other chapters um, that you may not have access to, he one of the areas that I see this potentially conflicting with some, some other things that he says is that in the first few chapters, he talks about the value of autonomy. We want to educate students to be able to kind of choose their own way of life. If you want to be uh, a fundamentalist member of a religious sect, you, you can do that. You can freely choose that. If you want to be a secular, you know, philosophy professor, you can, you can do that as well, whatever you want to be. Um, and he says one of the ways schools should do this is expose students to as many ways of life as possible so that they can see these ways of life and that these people can kind of like get into discussions and kind of share positions with each other and share viewpoints with each other. Now, if you take Brighouse's conception of public reason, it seems like what he's saying is we want schools to be really diverse so that people can dialogue with each other. But wait a minute, that dialogue can't include anything that's interesting about your political or about your position. So if you're a fundamentalist Christian, it's great that you're in school and you can have dialogues with people. But as long as you don't bring fundamentalist Christian principles into it. Yeah. It seems like that, that, um, that kind of thing, that kind of way of doing things is probably prejudicial to the kind of, you know, uh, insular groups as well, because... Um, there's a certain idea that maybe like growing, like take like, I was just in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and there are people that grow up there as Amish. And yeah, they see the English going by and they might like go to their stores once in a while, but they grow up in a certain kind of community where for the most part, they're not exposed to other alternative points of view. And if you were exposed to all these other alternative points of view from day one, when you're very young, you're almost certainly going to end up being very secular and liberal and placing high value and autonomy and self growth. <laughs> And there's a certain kind of value that might exist in those other kinds of societies, but those societies can't flourish if everybody's going to be made to live the kind of liberal lifestyle and then freely choose if they want the Amish commune when they're 25. It's just no one will end up choosing it. So I think his idea of like how we're supposed to, whether we're going to choose to be the fundamentalist Christian live, or you know, living in a commune or living an Amish lifestyle or living, living kind of a secular academic lifestyle or whatever, that that his way of choosing that is sort of prejudiced on behalf of the secular view. That's what almost everyone who goes through that will end up selecting. And we know, I think we just know that empirically. That's just what we see when people grow up. Right. 
I know I've heard some people, particularly critics of public reason liberalism, say something like what public reason liberalism seems to be trying to doing, seems to be trying to do is make sure that when we talk, we're liberals. Yeah. Uh, which obviously alienates a lot of the people who, you know, we should argue are probably an important part of discussions. 